Hi there everyone, this is Sarah. Welcome to our webinar today. Um, today's topic is um, critical controls, safety differently. Um, so before I introduce our presenter, just to let you know that if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. Um, we might um, invite some feedback um, uh, using the chat panel. Um, there are, uh, we, as we're, with all our um, webinars, um, it does attract um, Australian Institute of Health and Safety CPD points if you are registered for that. We will record the webinar and share a video and podcast via email uh, later today and also in the HSCQ news tomorrow. So um, I'd like to welcome Kelvin again today. He is the Art of Works Managing Director. He has spoken at a webinar, I think, last year. Um, on a similar topic, he is a strategic th systems thinker with experience in human factors and organisational re-engineering. He developed his systems thinking approach working in the Royal Australian Air Force for 10 years. Following this for 10 years, he led systems and risk management programs across Asia Pacific. Pacific and Europe with Compass Group PLC, the world's largest support service company with more than 750,000 employees. So without further ado, over to you. Thanks for joining us, Kelvin. Thank you, Sarah. And um, thank you for the invitation uh, to uh, share in this uh, discussion today. It's something um, that we're, we're very um, passionate about, um, this idea of critical controls. And at Art of Work, we became really interested in exploring um, the idea of critical controls in the light of safety differently and applying a safety, safety differently lens to the critical control uh, concepts. So I'm sort of going to start my um, presentation from just posing the question is, well, what's wrong with critical controls as we, we, we currently um, structure and uh, manage them? And I'm going to put a few of my um, uh, perceptions and insights and experience um, are around the space. If we look at, you know, how we present critical controls to, to boards um, and executives, you know, typically what we tend to do is to go through um, a process of identifying our material risks um, and uh, in those material risks, um, attaching uh, critical controls to that. Uh, and the, the premise being, um, these are the controls that are required um, uh, to effectively manage um, the material risk that's attached. And then we go through a process of uh, feeding back, um, you know, a, a risk um, uh, assessment of that process. And if we typically look at these uh, risk assessments from an executive point of view, what they will see is the material risks, the critical controls, and um, a residual risk outcome that, that tend to, tends to look uh, uh, like um, the, the risk is uh, low or very low as a result of the critical controls uh, being in place. And I think what that does is, firstly, um, it creates a false sense of uh, comfort uh, in terms uh, of the executive understanding what the actual transactional uh, nature of the risks are in their organisation. And, and, and secondly, it misinterprets the reliability of the controls that we design and put in place. And what we've discovered, there's a lot of flaws and a lot of assumptions that are put in place when we go through the process of designing and implementing um, critical controls. And I'm going to examine those um, in a, a, a little bit of, of detail. I'm going to start this proposition thinking about this question then. What is it the board and leadership actually needs. So if, if we go back to the obligations that they're required uh, to meet, their obligations of due diligence, the six elegance of, of due, um, due diligence that um, is uh, codified within the Model Act. Um, and, uh, uh, and this is in essence, you know, what um, they will be tested to to demonstrate in, in the event that there is something that has not gone, gone as uh, intended. So if you think about the critical control component within what they're obliged to do firstly is to understand the nature um, of the hazards that exist within the organisation, um, the control strategies um, that are in place um, and how well those control strategies um, are working, how reliable are they in essence. They also then the need to, to understand, you know, um, 
is critical are critical controls appropriately resourced? Um, has the right level of resource, and that might be within investment uh, from uh, capital uh, into the place. It might be investment into um, the management and compliance you know, of these processes, but they need to be able to demonstrate that they understand that they have appropriate resources. They also need to be able to, to demonstrate that there is a system of monitoring um, the performance of uh, uh, and controls. And, and finally, you need this, um, uh, it's sort of interlocked in some way, but a process of understanding, you know, how the system uh, complies. Um, so in terms of how critical controls are being transacted and complying with the way that they've been designed and set up within the safety management system. And then you need um, a process around the verify. And verify often gets interpreted in different ways, but part of the key element of verification is understanding how the controls function um, where the work is done and having some verification back from, from, from that place. And when we think about and look at our, our critical controls uh, and apply these tests, um, I think they often fall short of uh, meeting this obligation and giving board and leadership the, the information that they need to pro provide useful contribution to establishing better and more reliable critical controls in that space. So when we started on this journey, we thought very much about, well, who gets to decide? Who decides what the critical controls are and who decides um, as to uh, how those critical controls uh, will be deployed? And I think in, in the majority of experiences uh, that we see, uh, we would see it's you know what we would term subject matter experts. Um, these will be safety people, they may be uh, engineering people, but, but in essence, they're people with technical expertise uh, in the safety and, and the application um, of, of safety in that domain. And within that um, process, you know, the, the method that we often sort of deploy, you know, is, you know, using um, bow ties, pretty typical um, out there in trying to understand the, the hazards um, and understanding the threats and understanding the control strategies that are in place. So we see these deployed. I think typically, again, when we see this um, bow tie analysis process done, it is done by subject matter experts. Um, and the, the, the other, um, I suppose, um, component of this is how often is the um, control performance information reviewed in terms of the bow ties. So typically with bow ties, we see it's an exercise that is done at a set point in time. It might be every year or every couple of years where bow ties are put in place. Um, the design process goes through and in, in essence, it tends to get filed away uh, and doesn't become part of the, the living, uh, the lived experience of control performance. So it has a very, narrow view and it really comes from the view of the subject matter matter experts and then when we look at the um, the the nature of controls uh, i think it's interesting to understand how do we assess them so when we're looking at this control strategies and we bring it in in terms of you know um, a risk matrix uh, which is you know fairly typical in this this approach we have this approach of trying to interpret a control. I'm just using the example of um, a swim, um, uh, for example, and the safety, you know, our, our subject matter experts will go through a process of look, un understanding the, the, the nature uh, of the risk that's, um, and the hazard that's being addressed, looking at the potential consequences um, that it has applied, and then looking at the application of the control and then determining you know, what the impact that will have um, on the potential um, uh, consequences as such. And so we ended up, you know, with uh, these ratings. So if we, if we take a swim, I think it's, it's really interesting how we sort of examine this and how we interpret it. And, and the assumptions that we make that a procedure um, by its nature um, uh, can be uh, interpreted as a highly reliable control. The question is, how do we know that? How do we know that the swim that's in place actually performs? Is it fit for purpose? Um, is it well designed? Is it used? Um, ra you know, rather than we can get into a myopic sort of situation where we think 
that all procedures are good procedures um, and once they're applied, all that needs to happen is that the, the user of that uh, procedure needs to comply um, and the control will be satisfactorily uh, executed uh, in this space. So as we went and explored this um, process and we've had a lot of experience in, in this, <laughs> this space, it's really interesting the diversity of opinion um, or opinion and practice uh, out there about the concept of what a critical control is. And after going through many workshops uh, in this space with subject matter experts, um, it is quite uh, interesting to see the interpretation um, around critical controls. So I thought I would use an example, and I'm going to take an example out of the food safety um, process, because I think um, it's been nicely executed uh, within uh, food safety, this, this concept of critical control. So um, the first thing that we would say about this process is that a control is essential to preventing the loss um, of control of a damaging energy. And I'm going to come to explain that uh, in, in a moment. But in the food safety uh, context, um, the, um, the process is HACCP, um, people commonly see that organisations are certif certified for, but they've got, the, got the, this um, a method of hazard analysis critical control point. And in that, what they're trying to under, understand is what, what is the hazard um, that sits within the food production? And then what is the critical control point that will ensure the safety of the food? So the most common one that sits in this space that we will see out there is they've identified temperature, the, uh, the, sto the storage temperature of the food. And it's, it's in two conditions that when it's been stored, that it is less than five degrees um, uh, Celsius um, and when it's uh, been prepared and heated, that it's heated to 60 degrees or more in the cooking process. And that, uh, and that would establish, that's the critical control. That's the control that we go and look at to see that's in place when food has been produced, that the production is actually cheap. There, there's obviously more controls in this space, but as an example of a critical control, I think it works quite nicely. It's, um, to me, that's a clear uh, critical control. If we look at the, um, another context and, and we said that the control was the training and competency um, uh, of um, the food handlers to um, ensure that the temperature control is made, um, that would not be a critical control in, in our interpretation. Now it has a place in that control, but it's not the critical control. Um, the control itself is the temperature um, uh, um, control that you're looking for. And then you'll look at ways to supporting and make sure that control functions um, carefully. So the part of this process is to, to, to reframe and get and, and be clear about what we think critical controls are and are not and how they fit. And um, when we're looking at our control strategies, how are the controls um, that we design fit in to this particular con context. So in going through this process, um, we've given a lot of thought and, and done a lot of work and um, a lot of design in this space to this question of what we really want to know is how do we achieve control effectiveness? If we've got a control in place, how can we be confident that that control um, is actually working? How reliable is that control? And in doing so, we've brought in you know, some of the elements of safe, safety differently to achieve this. Now, what's interesting in this space is there is a real bridge between some of the processes that sit within a safety one domain and some of the process of safety two. Um, and in this exercise, there's, there's um, an active marriage between these two processes. It's not about doing one thing um, or the other in that context. So. The first part of the principle that we came to uh, review and apply is principle one from safety differently is that people are a solution to harness. And the question then becomes, how do we actually bring that principle to life within the context of critical control? And then the, the other concept that we really work, work from is what we really wanted to understand is how do we understand performance? You know. How do we understand controls as they perform in the system? You know, what are the things that people depend upon to make the controls work? You know, whether it be the tools, the resources, you know, the skills, and understand conditions and constraints, and make sure that we inject that 
uh, into our, our thinking. So in embarking uh, on this um, path, um, we've uh, stepped into the process of using human-centred design as being central to the control effectiveness process. And I'll, I'll show you how this uh, works and works in practice. But fundamentally, the concept of critical control is now based around the user and using um, you, uh, the human-centred design to understand the user experience and all the work that sits around your experience. So the, the diagram that you're looking, looking at here on the screen comes uh, from Stanford University, the Design Council, and it's uh, those who are familiar with this process, it's a standard um, a template for uh, doing human-centered design. So uh, within the critical control uh, methodology, we've adapted this and, and where you're coming into that is, is starting from a control that you're looking for and then you're going back to go and test it with the users of that control is you want to understand and listen uh, to them. You want to understand the, um, uh, the view of the world about those controls um, standing in their shoes so you can empathise uh, with, with their process. Once you've done that and collected some information, you can think differently and start to redefine and, and come up with new ideas. And once you've uh, developed some ideas, you can take those ideas and go out and test them um, and put them into place. And where you see successful response to that, you can then go and widely you know, um, make a change to an existing system or deploy a new concept across um, the organisation. But the whole premise um, of this is it's if it's coming very much from the perspective of those who use the controls as being really central um, to the design process. So go back to that question now about um, who decides on a control. And what we're now um, uh, going to try and actively achieve is the integration between the two groups is there's a clear role for subject matter experts uh, in this space. But what we discovered is subject matter experts need better intelligence. They need better data to work from. And that data is the data that they can get from the users, the end users um, of, of a control. Um, so the process is is trying to um, reverse uh, the model, go to the frontline experts first to harvest some intelligence and some insight in that place and bring that information you know, back to the subject matter experts so they can understand the controls and how they perform in, in a different, different way. So in redesigning this process, we went back to some of the basic concepts. So firstly, in designing uh, our understanding critical controls, we went back to um, the, the, the Had and Viner um, energy damage model as a way of actually classifying and understanding the critical controls. So we went back to this idea of understanding what are the damaging energies um, that we're working with and then working in terms of a human-centred des design model to actually understand our control strategies uh, within that space. And the principle being is that ultimately we're trying to prevent the expression of a damaging energy uh, in a workplace, in the environment, or, uh, uh, or uh, for people who are working uh, within that, that context. Um, so on this, uh, we've sort of uh, been working and mapped up um, an ex sort of an extended list of what that damaging energy might, uh, might look like to uh, help with the classification process that we work with. And the next thing that we went back to is the hierarchy of control, which is central to it's in all the legislation and we have to deal with it. It's a very safety one uh, model, but I think it's, it hasn't been well understood in this process. So we've tended to treat the hierarchy of control as, uh, as independent um, steps so that um, you're either one thing or the other. You're either an administrative control or it's an engineering control or it's a separation control or it's a substitution control um, or ultimately you've stepped into the elimination uh, of that process. When we worked through and, and redefined our thinking around, around this, we, you know, we discovered it was rare for a control to stand in its own right. It's extremely rare for an engineering control to not have significant um, human factors elements and therefore be very dependent on, uh, on people, a human dependent uh, control. And by its very nature, we then say, well, if we're understanding controls, you need to actually merge these two concepts together. You need to look at the engineering control and what is the level of human dependency 
um, that uh, uh, is in the design of this crud control. And the principle being um, still within this fact that uh, the more or the le or if, let's say I'll go the less, the less human dependency that you have in the control, um, the more reliable that that control uh, will be. So the more it depends on um, you know, the capacity, skill, um, the training, following a procedure, you know, a whole lot of sequential actions, uh, the more predictable it is that control will fail at some, some point in time. So where we ended up with is designing um, a system of understanding control effectiveness. And we under, we, um, we've broken this down to a, a set of uh, points to understand controls. Uh, and I'll go through these in uh, a, a short summary in a moment. But the, the, the idea is firstly, we want to understand what the robustness is of the control is. And this is a combination of the hierarchy of control and its dependency on human factors. We want to understand the alignment of the control, um, and this is how it fits with how work is done. We want to understand how adaptable the control is, and also where we've got human dependency, we, we, we want to understand how well or how poorly that that is desired, designed, and ultimately we'll come up with score to give an analysis of, of a control. So, like I said, the first the, the first elements done when we go through and we establish we're looking at a critical control. The first thing that we do is with the um, subject matter experts, they will determine the hierarchy of controls and um, uh, and some other features of that. We'll go, um, they'll also de um, determine what are the organisational factors that are relevant to that control, and that will end up with uh, an assessment of robustness uh, in that space. Now, what, what we're looking at in this place is th this idea of the uh, interconnection between hard controls and human um, uh, dependent controls. What we're saying in this model is hard controls don't um, equal robust um, and effective controls because they're dependent on these, these other factors. Uh, you know, on its own, if you take the, the hierarchy of controls in isolation, it's missing a whole lot of other features um, uh, in this process is without the support of people, um, these hard controls are not very effective. So, what we're then doing is saying, well, there's a set of human factors that um, are attached um, to this process. And to make um, the controls reliable and effective, we have to take these human performance factors uh, into account. Everything that ranges you know, from safety culture and change management and these processes to fitness for work and workload, these are all the standard human factors that we assess. Now, the human factors that we've built into this model have been drawn from the Western Australian Department of Mines, Industry and Regulation, the MIRS. So these are the 10 factors, quite a bit of information, but there, there's a number of, of models in this space that work. We've chosen this particular one. You could choose the Keel Centre, for example, or others. But uh, for our purposes, we've used these as our process. And then what we've, we've done is saying, the first thing that we do is let's understand, you know, uh, where the control sits in terms of the hierarchy of control. And then we go and check against the system of what are the elements um, that this control depends on. So we, we simply go and check, you know, um, is it dependent on human reliability? Is it dependent on permits, procedures, training, you know, the like? And we, we simply um, uh, check those in to understand it. The idea being if you've got all these dependencies uh, in all these areas, you're looking at a less reliable and effective control. But if you're looking at a control, um, that doesn't have these dependencies. So in this case, we've just chosen a substitution control um, and the only dependency it has is maintenance inspection. We can um, uh, conclude that that is going to be a more reliable and effective uh, control in its nature. Uh, so what the key to this is not saying that those are right or wrong, but understanding you know, the level of dependency is going to change how we inter interact with the control. So when we, we, we then go to look and think about um, the human dependency element. So there's two things, and this is where we bring in user-centered design in this process. Um, now for the human factors part of the session, that's where we use subject matter experts. And for the user experience uh, mode, this is where um, we use um, the end users of, of, of the control. And in the process, what we go and do is we test with the users things like, you know, um, how discoverable the controls? You know, how do you know um, that you have to use the control? Um, you might design, you know, um, does the control, control work 
Uh, is it well designed for the work that you do? And a range of things. There's five factors that we take into a place. But we go and test with them in using this control in their settings, you know, how well does it work for them as a user? The next element um, that we test, and this is all done with um, the front line, is the alignment of the control. We want to understand, firstly, whether the control helps or hinders the individual worker. Does it make it easier for them to, um, to do the task that they're working on, or does it make it more, more difficult in that, in that space? So, so what, what's interesting about this, when we look at the, the scores about this, it starts, well, in the combination of, of those, I'll go to the other one first, I'll come back. Um, we also want to understand whether control helps or hinders the objective of the work that's been done. So does it make the task being complete that, that needs to be done easier to get done? So this is um, the, the broad objective of the piece of work that, that, that's been done in their context. So when we look at the combination of these, if you get um, a control that uh, the workers feed back to you, that it hinders their work and it also hinders um, the, the, the nature of the task that's been done, you can reasonably predict this is a place where you're going to get work around for a control. So um, th this, this score is quite useful in understanding the better you design controls. And I would use an example here like scaffolding as an example of control. If we, if we test scaffolding with construction workers on a, you know, on a fixed building, it scores quite well because the, um, it, whilst it takes some effort to put in place, um, <coughs> workers actually, uh, it makes their, their job of doing the construction a lot easier and it actually helps the construction task that, that's been done. Um, if we're using, uh, looking at um, scaffolding and doing maintenance on a building, it scores pretty poorly because it, it takes a lot of work and effort to put in place and people will find workarounds uh, to put in place. And this is where you get misuse of ladders, whereas <coughs> an elevated work platform will score quite well in this context. So um, these, this system is quite good at calibrating those sort, sorts of, of issues. Um, and uh, the final element that we, we analyze and look at is response to change. How adaptable is the control? So particularly where you've got, you got um, uh, conditions that are varying or, or um, different uh, operational needs, the control adaptability um, can be quite important. And again, we take this feedback from those who use the control um, to tell us, you know, how easy it is to adapt to the work and how well can they recover uh, when something doesn't go right with that control. So the end result is we end up um, with an output of an analysis. We, we, we get this breakdown uh, for a control. Um, we understand where it sits on the humor, a hierarchy of controls. We understand the organizational factors. And we understand the robustness <coughs> of, of the control. Um, we also understand the human dependency, you know, um, in terms of how it rates from the user experience. Um, and we also understand the human factors. And, and you get this broken down as well as what the increments are. We get um, uh, an output for the alignment, and uh, we also then get an overall score um, for the, the control. And then we end up with a system of being a, a final overall rating for the control from being very low effectiveness through to uh, being highly effective uh, as such. And in essence, what you end up out of this process is for each control, you'll end up with a control effectiveness score. Now this is the information it goes back to the executive and they'll see it in a form uh, like this for um, the list of critical controls. And so you might take a material risk and you can present uh, the critical controls and you can give a breakdown then of overall, you know, what the control effectiveness is. Um, and that gives an indication of where attention should be paid uh, to thinking about redesign or changing the control. If you've got controls are down around the 2.5 level, um, uh, then um, you need to um, put some attention into that. So this is giving them a very different input from our traditional risk assessment of saying uh, we've got a control in place and the residual risk is very low as such. Now this process becomes a continuing um, process. The idea is if we think about it in practice, once we have this information in controls, we constantly feed that back into the design process. So constantly go out to the field, <coughs> take input from um, uh, you know, how the control has been performing. We find the data is very different in, in different organisational operational uh, settings and that you constantly use that information uh, to bring that through your engineering process. 
Um, and that you know, this is you know the uh, the model of you know thinking about resilience uh, engineering, and this concept process. You know, thinking about how do we plan um, and build design. Um, What's, how well do um, our controls respond in this? How do we get, you know, um, take the, get some information, take it back in the redesign process? And then how do we learn and adapt and take it back into the start of the process for how we do work? The work as um, imagined, uh, taking the input for, from the work uh, as done in that space. So this is, when you think about this method, this is the summary, you know, of uh, using design thinking in the control space is thinking we understand um, our uh, material risks. We go through a process of identifying the causal pathways and then we go through and engage this process through the design. So when I was saying earlier about the subject matter experts having better information, that's what we're then looking at through this design process is taking the information through control effectiveness, which is come from the engage and listen uh, component, which is where the control effectiveness is done. And that gives the information is, well, let's reframe and redesign the control based on those inputs. And again, we would recommend that that is done um, harnessing, you know, um, uh, input from those that uh, do the work, being involved in that design process, come go through a process of um, iterating, testing and building and depth and controls. And once um, you know, you've got an idea that that's working or not working, you, you'll um, go through another strategy. But if it is working, you'll launch and scale um, the process. So it becomes a, a constant design process. So Sarah, that probably brings me to the point where um, you know, it'd be good to take some questions or, or discuss um, other material. Uh, and as you know, I can't see the, the chat on my screen. So, um, uh, very happy if you are able to um, uh, bring anything through or um, raise yep. anything you would like me to follow up. Sure. Well, I I would invite people to um, use the Q and A panel to ask questions, and we'll hopefully be able to deal with them. Um, there is a chat. Um, okay, it's um, it's from Carolyn, and she just said, "Love it. Thank you." So it's nice. Um, there was a question it, by email um, from a person called Valerie. Do you- I might stop do, sharing my screen. I might be able to see the chat then. So I'll try that. Okay, I can see the chat now. Okay, Which there is you go. Uh, very easy. Um, so um, thanks, um, uh, Carolyn, um, for feed, feeding that back. Um, if anyone else wants to put um, a question into chat. I can also have a look at um, uh, Q and A. See if there's anything there. No, I've got no open questions at the moment. Um, there was a question by Otherwise, email. It's a very quiet session. Um, Kelvin, there was a question by email. Did you hear that? Um, Hello, can you hear me? I don't think um, you can. I can check back, Sarah, just um, seeing whether there's anything that's come through to you. Um, I don't think you can hear me. Oh, I don't know if anyone else can. Can I ask people in the chat panel um, if they can hear me? Because I may have lost um, speaker. I've got it. Oh, great. Some questions coming up. Thanks. Um, yeah, where, where can um, you learn more um, about this? Um, you, you can certainly you know, uh, contact us um, and I think Sarah will share a link um, after the, um, the process. Um, um, and you can contact me directly um, also, uh, uh, Thomas. Um, uh, happy, happy to do that. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, yeah, we can, we can share, you know, um, some of the experience uh, we've been working with a number of organisations across this, um, uh, uh, looking at large miners and um, across in industries like um, uh, defence and construction and the like. So we're happy to share that experience as well. And Thomas, it might be just you and I on, on the webinar. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, I think I've got some more in chat, so I'll try that. Oh, great. Um, yeah, right, Louise is there. Yep, yeah. uh, everyone can hear me, which is fantastic. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, right, so I was just saying that I can't uh, uh, hear Sarah, but that's fantastic. Yeah, look, so look, if there's any other um, questions, please put them uh, up into chat. Yep, no, I've got the message from Sarah. Right. Okay, I've got a message, um, a, a question from James. Um, does this approach require quite prescriptive controls rather than performance outcome-based uh, controls in order to be reliably um, assessed? Um, no, look, the, that, that's the interesting nature about this is you can um, uh, have quite a sophisticated control uh, in the design process and it sort of lends itself into that space um, because um, what it's allowing you to do is taking you know, all of the elements in place and not just the, the, the critical control itself you know can be quite constrained but, but when you look at the supporting elements um, around that this will bring that information uh, into play so I think it is quite well suited to try to understand the more complex nature of controls and how they interface with um, uh, how the work is actually done in that space. Yeah, so um, Sarah has asked me, we had a question about um, performance measures um, uh, and uh, that uh, was submitted uh, by, by email and Really, the, so in the essence, when we um, uh, look at the, the resulting control effectiveness scores, this allows us to actually build KPIs around this space. So we can start to con, uh, can put KPIs around the level um, of control effectiveness uh, that you have for um, a given risk or a given geography or, or a given um, work activity that, that sets it into place. So it actually sets itself quite nicely in that space. And you can also put some supporting performance measures, particularly as you can get some breakdown about, you know, the human factors uh, elements and how well they're performing in that space. What you might find, for example, that, that the control strategy is being compromised, you know, by poorly designed um, uh, human factor elements. And it will give you an indication as to what those human factor elements are and again, you can certainly drive that by um, uh, have uh, performance uh, indicators in, in, in place to see, you know, to set the stage of what you should be sustaining your control effectiveness at in, the, in those different domains. Okay, Louise has asked the, um, the, the broader question. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have the easy answer, uh, Louise, uh, uh, to that is um, uh, when you're bringing it into a new company, what we generally recommend is to try something small in the space. So, like, the, and this is not a bad space, um, like something in the critical control piece, because when you use this sort of technique, um, you're using some of the elements of safety differently, but you still got a lot of that safety one sort of structuring component around it and it can be easier to take an organization in with you know thinking about that control process but the second way is you know thinking uh, in this space is we, we like micro experiments in particular try a small learning team um, something like that um, the learning teams i think are a really good way to to show how you can get um, a, um, a much richer and better response you know from a safety challenge uh, that you've got and take it back as a case study in point, and that will often enable you to broaden out and, and uh, explore, you know, the broader concepts of safety differently. So we, we never recommend coming in and just trying to say, oh, we need to do, do it all differently now. Um, I think it's always important to respect um, the culture and practice and the work that's been done and build upon it um, rather than substitute it. Okay, wish you luck on that on that journey, Louise. So, uh, uh, but uh, feel free to reach out if you um, uh, if that uh, if there's anything we can do to help you.
I see um, Sarah's put a, a message up there, I think, about the next webinar. And I think we've covered everything off now. Um, yeah, that looks good. So Sarah, I think that probably brings us to a conclusion, unless there's more questions. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, thanks everyone who's been part of the, the webinar. And I hope um, you saw something a little bit different in this space and uh, we would be very keen, you know, if anyone wants to explore this idea, uh, very, very happy to, to have that discussion.